mastering an ability has nothing to do with talent. That's a misconception that people often have. Sure, talent is a great thing to have, but it can only take you so far. We look at famous athletes, actors, and singers, and our first thought is always how talented they are. But most of the time, their success is only partly to do with talent. Because what they did to succeed and what you really need to master an ability is practice. This might sound like the most obvious thing in the world, but the shocking truth is a lot of people don't really know how to practice something. And we're not talking about mindless repetition here. No, the key to mastering any Anything is deliberate practice, and by the end of this video, you'll know how to use it to conquer any challenge. Welcome to ALUX. Practice with purpose. What do you know about Kobe Bryant? Kobe's career in the NBA was nothing short of excellent. He won five NBA championships and two Olympic gold medals, and his net worth reached more than $200 million while he played. So how do you think he became so good? I'll give you a hint. It wasn't only talent. Even at the top of his game, Kobe never faltered with his practice and always practiced with a purpose. There's a story from the 2012 Olympics that really nails down who Kobe was. A trainer named Robert was working with Team USA in Las Vegas to prepare them for the Olympics. Around 4.15 a.m., Kobe called him and asked him to help him with some conditioning work. Robert got ready and headed to the gym where he found Kobe drenched in sweat. He had already been exercising and practicing on his own. After Robert arrived, they did conditioning training for an hour and 15 minutes, then strength training for 45 minutes. After that, Robert left while Kobe continued to practice. When they met again for the actual training of the team, Robert approached Kobe and asked when he had finished his training, at which point Kobe told him he just had. He wanted to do 800 shots, and he did. So to recap, Kobe started training at 4.30 a.m., then lifted weights from 6 to 7 a.m., then practiced 800 jump shots until 11 a.m. You see, Kobe wasn't just exercising for the sake of exercising. He had a very clear goal in mind, to make 800 jump shots. That is deliberate practice. It's not just practice for the sake of it or mindless repetition. It's having a clearly defined purpose, an aim to improve your performance. You can feel that in a tweet by New York Times bestselling author James Clear that perfectly captures the whole deal behind deliberate practice. What looks like talent is often careful preparation. What looks like skill is often persistent revision. That is Kobe to a T, and that's what you need. A lot of the time we see top performers and the high achievers as gods, when in reality they just put in the time more than we do. You can't become great overnight. It takes time and commitment. When we look at the people at the top of the mountain, we forget about all the work they put in to get there. No one is born a master. You have to work to be called one of those. Experts are made, not born. Bruce Lee once said, I fear not the man who practices 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. And we understand where he's coming from. Nobody would like to be on the other end of that kick. But it's also just so much more than that. It shows that when you see an expert, you're seeing someone that's practiced something 10,000 times. But even practicing alone wouldn't be good enough. Deliberate practice is much more than just practicing. It requires focused attention, specific goals, and a lot of feedback. It's about being efficient with your practice. Let's go back to the example of Kobe. Why do you think he wanted help in his training? I mean, he was Kobe Bryant. But the truth is, for practice to be effective, you need feedback. If you're practicing in a vacuum, you'll have a hard time seeing what your flaws are or how to improve. An outside perspective can be crucial to knowing how to reach your full potential. Imagine that you're at a basketball court practicing free throws. You grab the ball, you throw it, you pick it up, you do it again, over and over. You're going to improve, but you could improve much faster by slowing down and paying attention to what you're doing. 
Is your technique solid? Are you applying enough strength? You need to be mindful of all of the elements in your practice, and feedback can help you with that. Learning something on your own can be great, but learning is so much more effective with guidance and feedback. When you practice without feedback, you could be repeating the same mistakes without even knowing it. And this could actually help you develop a bad habit instead of the results that you're looking for. You can't expect to just know things or that things will go correctly the right way. Feedback can help you recognize where your weaknesses are. Because let's be real, once you develop a bad habit, it can be hell to undo it. We're all creatures of habit, it's human nature, and we're not the best at letting them go. The Sunk Cost Fallacy have you ever stuck around in a relationship that you knew wasn't going anywhere, only because you'd been together for so long? People have a really hard time leaving a path after they've started it. We hate the idea of having wasted our time or money on projects that aren't going anywhere. We eat food we don't like because we already paid for it. We continue to invest in a failing project hoping it'll turn around. And when we stick around in jobs that we hate because we think that's how it's supposed to be, shouldn't we recognize when to cut our losses? Instead, we double down and continue until things inevitably fail. That's called a sunk cost fallacy. A sunk cost is one you've already paid and you can't recover. And it's not exclusively about money. A sunk cost could also be time or effort invested into something. We factor in the time and money spent when we think about whether or not these actions are good for us, but we fail to grasp a simple concept. We're not getting that time or money back, it's already gone. And this causes us to make irrational decisions instead of just considering better alternatives. The sunk cost makes people afraid of changing careers, of learning something new. They don't want to face the fact that maybe what they're doing now isn't good enough, that things aren't going anywhere. But the world is changing right below our feet and we can't afford to stick with one thing forever. At least, not if you want to make it in life. Now this doesn't mean that you should just jump ship at the first sign of trouble. Just that you need to take out the cost from the equation. If you are making this decision from scratch, would you continue with that path? If your answer is no, then why would you continue now? You already paid for the food. You can't recover those years you spent with someone. Sometimes it's just better to move on to something new. And this isn't exclusively a small-scale problem. Even big companies and governments suffer from this. Take, for example, the Concorde jet. In 1956, the Supersonic Transport Aircraft Committee gathered to discuss the creation of a supersonic airplane, the Concorde. This was a joint project by French and British companies and their governments, and they estimated it would cost cost almost $100 million to complete it. However, halfway through, they realized it would cost a lot more than that, and the plane would never make up for the cost. But did they stop? No, they already had spent all that time and money, so they figured it would be best to continue spending time and money on something that would never pay off. And what happened in the end? The costs ascended to $2 billion and the Concorde only operated for 30 years. As you can see, we're all vulnerable to the sunken cost fallacy, but you can't let that stop you. Just because you've been doing the same thing forever doesn't mean it's actually good for you or you can't find something better. There are countless examples of people who found more success when they let their fear go and tried something new. Tim and Nina Zagat left their legal careers when they were 42 and started to write restaurant guides. Their company is now part of Google. Vera Wang opened her first bridal boutique at the age of 41 after commissioning her own wedding dress for $10,000. Ray Kroc was a 50-year-old salesman when he bought his first McDonald's, which went on to turn into a worldwide phenomenon. And this list goes on and on, so let's switch gears and talk about applying deliberate practice in your life. Okay, so in order for deliberate practice to be effective, you have to apply its five main principles. Number one, you need more than talent. Practice is what separates good from great. We've already brought this one up before, but it bears repeating. Take, for example, the Spanish violinist Pablo Sarasate. He practiced 14 hours every day for 37 years. People consider him a genius now, but that's all thanks to his arduous work. Number two, great performance requires hard work and repetition. 
In order to succeed at something, you'll need repeated and sustained practice. Repeated practice helps you develop a type of mental muscle memory, and consistency will provide you with constant exposure. But in order for this to work, you have to use a gradual process, which is why… Number 3. Break down your activity into smaller tasks. You want quality more than quantity. Yes, you will repeat these tasks a lot, but if you want each step of the process to be as productive as it can be, giving your all in short bursts is better than working all day when your mind and heart aren't in it. Staying focused for long periods of time can be difficult, which is why you want to break it down into smaller periods. It makes it a lot more manageable. This can also be applied to the beginning of an activity. You don't necessarily want to go off the deep end right away. That could drain you of your motivation. Sometimes it's better to start small but stick with it. Case in point, number four, set goals and persevere. Motivation is crucial to achieving your goals as well as perseverance, but sometimes working up that motivation can be hard. As we mentioned before, start small, but start now. If you want to go to the gym, start by just going there. Even if you don't exercise, hell, just stay in the parking lot if you want. But do it every day. Eventually, you'll work to do a little bit more. Maybe you'll just be walking on the treadmill one day. Then you're jogging, and then you're running every day. But you have to start somewhere. Working your way from small and easy tasks to more complex ones allows you to be more motivated and persevere. You will feel like you're winning and getting better because you are. And we all love that feeling, right? And last but not least, number five, get feedback in the moment. We spoke about the importance of feedback before, but it's crucial you get it as you're practicing. You want to know right away what you're doing wrong or right and why. Descriptive feedback is what allows you to keep improving. You just, you don't want too much of it though because it can become overwhelming. If you strive for deliberate practice, you'll start to see your performance improve dramatically in any aspect of your life where you apply it. It'll require a lot of hard work, commitment, and consistency. And you also have to understand that changes need time. But you know what they say, nothing good in life comes easy. You have to want it, and if you don't, then you have to find that motivation wherever you can, even in small places. Taking little steps is better than taking no steps, and before you know it, you'll be well on your way. Alright Aluxers, we're almost done with this one for today, but of course you stuck with us until the end, and as a thank you, you always get a bonus for it. So here's today's. Josh Kaufman, a best-selling author on books of business and skill acquisitions, mentions that the first 20 hours of practicing a skill are the hardest, but they're also the most crucial. He says you can't aim to master a skill right from the start, and you have to instead focus on achieving small goals within those first 20 hours. Learn the basics of whatever activity you're going for, and then you'll be on your path to mastery. Do you apply deliberate practice in your life, Aluxer? Let us know what you think about the topic in the comments section below. We always love hearing what you have to say.